And so I just find that interesting. Those of you not as a musical man, I, I have to not go in that direction because I, I kind of want to spend a little bit of time with it, but I need mean not. But there's seven cells of the human body completely that replace themselves every seven years. You just can't make this kind of stuff up. In the book of Revelation, there's seven golden candlesticks, there's seven churches, there's seven stars, there's seven angels. There's, in chapter 4, there are seven lamps, there's seven spirits of God. In chapter 5, there's a scroll book with seven seals. There's a lamp with seven horns, seven eyes, seven things that the Lamb receives in chapter 5. Power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. Chapter 6, the Lamb opened, the lamb opened seven seals. Chapter 8, John saw seven angels that blow seven trumpets. Chapter 10, seven thunders. Chapter 12, great red dragon having seven heads, seven crowns on his head. The beast with seven heads, chapter 13. Chapter 15, seven angels carrying seven vowels which contain seven plagues. Chapter 17, woman riding a beast which has seven heads, seven mountains, seven kings. Chapter 21, seven angels, seven bowls, seven plagues. Then after that, everything is a multiple of 12. So we kind of get the point. Uh, that was not very interesting to type. Now, I'm not the fastest typist in the room here. So this is what Al Dalai would love. And so after, after 21, everything moves into multiples of 12. That's very interesting. Don't have time. If we'd like to look at that at another time. And we probably will. So if, if I have not convinced you, seven is repeated greatly in this book. Somebody talk back to me. I know we're teaching this, right? Say amen. Let me, let me know that we're, we're all breathing. Here, here's, here's, here's what's important. It's important to see that in each of those situations, all of those citations, seven is not always to be understood literally. It, it, Saints, I don't know how to say this. Go back to chapter 1, verse uh, 1, 2, and 3. The things that God was showing to Jesus, gave to Jesus. Jesus gave it to John. John has given it to the churches. He signified it. It was signified. It was in signs. And so if you just read that list that I just read you, this almost sounds like a horror movie. Dragons and seven heads and seven eyes, seven beasts. I mean, what kind of book are we studying tonight? So understand that 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 seven has must have not only a significant now watch seven is seven is a prime number, but it's made up of six and it's made up of three and three plus one. And you say, well, that, numerology, that's not scriptural. No, New Age people have perverted the concept of numbers. But originally, it's like music, it's like the arts, it's like dance, it's like everything else. Just because the world has perverted it does not mean it did not have its beginnings in God and Christ. Amen. The church has just abandoned it and let the world have it. But I'm telling you there's significance in numbers, not to go too far with it, but, but to understand seven is a, is a number made up of three and three. Three is important all through Scripture. God spoke in threes. I have a list of about 120 places where God spoke in threes, where he describes himself in threes. As, and so threes become important. It's also the number six, which is the number man, plus one. So seven teaches us that, that pure man, pure humanity is inadequate. But when you give, when you put humanity plus one, that's how we move into fullness. And so if we look at each, each of these churches, and these are, these are all literal churches that occupied a place in Asia, minor. Uh, a couple years ago, I was working with a pastor who was given the assignment to help start IPH churches in the Turkey area where literally these seven churches literally used to be. And he has since abandoned that assignment. There's something about that assignment that stirs in my spirit. I want to be a part. I, I'm not saying I'm going to move there, but I want to be a part of helping establish churches in what used to be Laodicea, Philadelphia, Sardis, Thyatira, Smyrna, Ephesus, Pergamos. And you pray for me. That assignment is still out there waiting for somebody to take that. Mm -hmm. And so if we look at these seven churches that are literal, 
churches. These are not spiritual, uh, uh, symbolic churches. But there were seven real churches. And what's interesting is look at the churches that are not in this seven. Rome, Jerusalem, Thessalonica, Colossae, the church at Galatia. I mean, there's some significant churches. Corinth, there's some significant churches that are not in this seven. But these seven are positioned rather interestingly. Asia is a word that means mire or stuck. And so these, these churches, I think we could, except for a couple, say there's something stuck with some of these churches. But God is about to bring some fresh breath into his church. Now, why in the revelation of Jesus Christ would God spend two, two chapters talking about his church? Okay? Now, now, I'm asking that, and you are welcome to give some feedback, because I, I want it to be a little bit more, in, in, kind of more uh, interactive tonight. So, why would Christ, who is unbending himself, just take two chapters talking sure. about you? Well, he sure was trying to show that he and I talked a lot about dispensation yeah. And I do not believe in dispensationalism per dates. Right. But I definitely believe our period of time is in the human life. Absolutely. And I think that the Lord was showing it would be hard for me to believe that these seven churches set here and there and everywhere that would be that different from one another. That's true. So I have to believe there's something else in that message. That's right. So so in a book that's really about him. He's going to talk about you. Because you're part of the church, corporate. And I just think, I don't know if there's a right answer to that. I'm just saying, think about that. He's going to unveil himself in chapter 1. Remember John saw him, he described his hair, he described his garment, he described, he described his feet, he described his voice, he described his eyes. Very similar to the Shulamite in the Song of Solomon. Not, I'll call the Song of Solomon part one and the book of Revelation part two. Really ought to read those as a, I like to study them together. It really would mess you up um, in a good way. And so if uh, it, it, he unveils himself, but he immediately begins to go into this candle stand. I like to think of it as a garden. And he begins to walk amongst it. And he begins to immediately bring to his church his body. The expression of him. Well, wouldn't that be part of the key? If the church is his body. Okay, that's good. That is how his body should function. Okay. But there's, there's some function in these seven churches. But I mean, you will be surprised at, at, at what isn't spoken of. What is left out. You would think more things would be more specific in these seven churches. And there's, just, there's some. But I think, I think it's just interesting that two chapters at the very beginning are dedicated to the development of this theme. You're doing some things that are right. There's some things that are not exactly right. But there's a prophetic promise to an overcoming people that's in the midst of the things that are not exactly right. So a long time ago, I heard a guy say this statement, make this statement. With everything that's wrong in a local church, what's right is greater than the stuff that's wrong. And that, that encourages me because, I mean, I need, the, I need people to have faith in the local church. I need people to believe in the local church. And, and, and I need us to be faithful and committed to the local church because I, I just really believe it's a powerful expression to find the image of Christ. And if the church is dysfunctional, it's only because the church is only an expression of the people who attend there. Oh, I believe that a lot right there. We don't like our church. We want revival. And we come to a church and demand revival. Well, why don't you go to a church and be revival? All right. Go to a church and be a blessing. You know, go and become, become the victory that it needs. And I know that's relative, but that's very general. I can't do all things. I can't become all things. But I can do my part to encourage and support. And you understand. Anyway, trying to stay practical. Let's look at these seven churches. And, and by name, Ephesus means desirable. 
Pastor Sylvia, did you, did you take notes? Yeah. Okay, make sure you, you have a little time. And if you come in late, make sure you get these notes. Um, do we have them back there, Pastor Anderson? Let's make sure we get them. Let's put those back, whatever we have back there, so those coming in can follow where I am. We didn't, we didn't, I didn't, I didn't hand these out that I had. Okay. But we will, we'll give it to you before we leave. The, the word smarna means uh, myrrh or sweet smelling. Pergamum means elevation. Thyatira means incense. Sardis means remnant or escaping ones. Philadelphia obviously means brotherly love. And Laodicea means the people's choice or my right. My right. And so we can look at all seven of these churches and there's a description of that church based upon what that church is called because names are significant, especially in biblical times. And so at, when, you, when we look at the seven churches, I just want to give you some options of, of how maybe these seven churches can be prophetically understood. Now, what I don't want to do tonight, I just, I wrote this out for you, is, and you can read this on your own, I want you to take the next section and just use that for just personal reading when, when you're not here. What the community of each church was like and what the church was like. Now, churches like Ephesus, we know a little bit more about. Churches like Laodicea, we know a little bit more about. Some churches, we don't know much about their history, kind of much about them. And, and I reflect that in these notes. Of course, nowadays, with the Internet, I, I was surprised. When I did some of this study before, 17 years ago, when I was first writing some of this stuff out, I, I noticed that I didn't have internet, and you had to do it the old-fashioned way. You had to go to books, and you had to read through books, and you had to buy publications, and you had to listen to tapes. Nowadays, after spending hours upon hours pulling this material together, I went to like one web page that had it all just right out in front of me, and I was kind of discouraged and clicked it and deleted it and both. You know, anybody can do that. <laughs> anybody can go to a web page and find all this information. Do it the right way. Be old-fashioned in the sense of really read it yourself and really study and really get to know something about the community where these churches were, were founded. Why? Because that helps us understand that a church is, church's identity oftentimes has something to do with the culture and the community where it's placed. Okay. Anyway, you, you can read that and on your own. It's not that it's going to cause you to shout and say hallelujah, but it, it, I think it is interesting to, um, to get an idea of the church historically. Now, what I want to do now is let's take the church at Ephesus. 